take a moment. <laughs> That's okay. fine. I'm going to just have a sip of water. Perfect. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Dubowski, and I am a licensed acupuncturist in Chicago. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Rebecca Avern a very experienced acupuncturist in Oxford, England. And she also has a book coming out in September, not to mention a few other pretty cool things to talk about. So Rebecca, could you just maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure, thank you. So uh, as you said, I'm sitting here in sunny Oxford. Um, I have been a practicing acupuncturist for coming up to 20 years and for the last five or six years I've treated almost entirely children um, and I teach pediatric acupuncture and mm -hmm. regular acupuncture here in England and as you mentioned i have a book coming out with singing dragon in september which is exciting and what uh, is with, the title yeah good question uh, <laughs> it's going to be called acupuncture for babies children and teenagers and it's a textbook um, a color textbook and i hope it's going to be helpful and my main uh, reason for writing it is to try and inspire more acupuncturists to treat children. Uh, that was my, my biggest motivation for doing it because I don't think there are enough, in the UK anyway, there aren't really enough pediatric acupuncturists. It's something that some people do a little bit of, mm -hmm. but uh, also something that a lot of practitioners are somewhat nervous about doing. Uh, sometimes understandably so and quite rightly so because it's obviously different from treating adults yeah. so I wanted to write a book to help give people confidence to be able to start treating more children because there are so many of them that need it I think that is a fabulous point um, I would like to say that I am one of the lucky few who got to read Rebecca's book before it's even out and I've got to tell you, I was very, very impressed. I was impressed on many levels. Uh, one, you clearly worked so hard. Okay, so right <laughs> there, I just say, thank you. You know, I, oh my God. Because besides the fact that it's what, almost 800 pages? It is, it is. It's it is. quite big. I didn't think it would be that big. But once I started writing. Yes, yes. It just flowed out, really. Yeah. Right, but what's great about it, and what I really like is, despite the page count being a little daunting, is you have it really well sectioned out so that somebody can use it as a great resource so they can be like, okay, I need to learn more about this subject, go to the index or go to the, oh my God, I forgot, what's it called when you say the chapters? The content. They can go to the table of contents <laughs> and find out what they're looking for rather than reading all 800 pages if yeah, they don't want absolutely. to. I, I imagine it to be a book that people will dip in and out of, definitely. It's not designed to be read from cover to cover, and I, I wouldn't dream of <laughs> asking anyone <laughs> to have that for response. So, right. yeah, so uh, it's definitely, it, it's the kind of book that... Uh, I imagine people will have in their clinic and will refer to as and when they need it. And those that want to will, you know, if they know they have a, a child coming that mm -hmm. they've never treated before or whatever, then they might kind of look into it beforehand and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. No, this is definitely a book for the clinic. I mm. actually was just looking at books, you know, I have on my shelves and I don't think there's many great, okay, I don't know because I'm not a purveyor of the topic, but I think we could definitely use some more books focused on treating children and teenagers. Yeah, I think that's sure. right. Definitely. And where they do it, you did it clearly. And I Good. think that is a very hard task. I know from my own writing how much you have to go over it to make sure it's really clear. Yes. So you, how long did it take you to write? 
Um, well, it took me two years, but I have children myself and I'm obviously working a lot as well. So oh, yeah. it was sort of squeezed into whenever I could fit it in really. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a hard process, but also one that I really loved. And it's, it'll be really exciting to see the finished, the finished oh. item when it comes out. Are you going to have a party? Definitely. Yeah. Party. I just have to, yeah, I have to find the time to have a party. No, no, no. You must, you must <laughs> after all that work, yes. you must yes. make it a priority to have a yes. party. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. I think so for sure. Right now we'll check back in with Rebecca. Okay. Yeah. You that can party. do that. I okay. can give me six months and then check back okay. in. Okay. <laughs> six months. All right. We'll see. How is your book going to be different than other books? on Chinese medicine and pediatrics? So one thing that's different is that I, throughout the book, I distinguish how diagnosis and treatment needs to be different according to the age of the child. Okay. So whether they're a baby, a school-aged child, or a teenager. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a new thing. As far as I'm aware, that hasn't been done in any other books. Um, I put a strong focus on internal causes of disease in children. Mm -hmm. So in most of the pediatric texts that I learned from, the, the focus has been on diet and external pathogenic factors as causes of disease. And whilst it's true that they are still causes of disease, mm -hmm. certainly in my practice, uh, the, the causes of disease that I see every day that are really causing the problems for children are emotional issues. Either so That's big. That's, let me just yeah. stop you for a moment. Okay. Because not only do I think that's a big topic, but mm. later we're going to get to the mom questions. And mm. one of the things I noticed just kind of that came through in more than one was talking about how to deal with children, keeping them mentally healthy, how to mm. help them with their moods, how to help them going into puberty. Um, yeah. And I know we're going to get to more specific questions, but I think you're right. There's so much angst when so you're much growing angst. up. And so much angst. You know, you forget how, how strongly that, yes. that feels. Yes. And I think that's one of the ways in which acupuncture is so well suited to the treatment of children, because if you can support them whilst they're faced with all of this angst, mm -hmm. uh, and if you can keep their chi as balanced as possible, mm -hmm. you're potentially preventing not only um, those emotions becoming habituated so for example if you if you start as a child worrying incessantly at the age of five when you start school mm -hmm. right. then as you're still a work in progress as it were in terms of your chi developing right. then the worry becomes set in your chi it's a bit like mm -hmm. if you walk on cement that's not dry yet and you leave a footprint and then that's there forever so if you treat a child to prevent that worrying or lessen the worrying, then it means that they don't grow up with worry being a habitual emotion, which then affects their relationships, their working life, how they feel about themselves, oh, and also yeah. you know, leads to lots of other imbalances. And I think that also uh, <clears throat> going back to causes of, of disease, children's lifestyles i mean it's easy to idealize how things were isn't it there were very real challenges throughout the whole of history for mm -hmm. children yes but i think for 21st century children there's they're faced with a unique set of challenges uh mm -hmm. they tend to have very very busy over scheduled lifestyles mm -hmm. very often there's a lot of pressure and expectation put onto them. Uh, I think because we have, people tend to have fewer children, mm -hmm. then there are fewer children in the family to kind of carry the expectations of right. the parents. 
Um, we live in a very competitive world and I think children pick up on that. There's a general kind of fear of if you don't do well, you're not going to get into university and then you're not going to get a good job. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of culture of, of lack around. And I think those kind of things have an enormous impact on a, a fragile, growing, sensitive child. So, so what would be a tip you would give to parents mm. about how can you make that a little better or a little easier for your child so they just don't feel it so strongly? Because I know you can't get away from it for, for everything. No. No, unless you decide to, you know, totally escape right, and live right. in the Go to like a cabin um, in Africa. Yeah, exactly. The the piece of lifestyle advice that I give most often mm -hmm. to children from school age onwards to the parents is what can you cut out of your child's schedule? Perfect. Perfect. Just that. They okay. need time at home time when they're having unstructured activities where they can get into their imagination they can play fantasy games nothing mm -hmm. is being expected of them and they are just in one place being a child that That's i think is perfect now let me ask you this when you say to that parent what can you cut out of my your child's schedule mm. and they say well, we have ice skating and we have bowling and we have baton. And, you know, I, I don't like to think of them just doing nothing. Mm. How do you kind of counteract with this is the benefit your child will get if maybe you give up the baton? Yeah, good question. I say to them that just the the process and the job of growing and developing mm -hmm. is a full-time job certainly That's up to so the good. age of, of eight and and really then again at adolescence mm -hmm. and if your child is expending all of their energy on these external activities mm -hmm. then something is going to suffer and the first years of life are like building the foundations of a house oh, yes and yeah. if you get those foundations strong, it will serve them forever. Mm -hmm. You have to play the long game. But if, they're, if all of their chi is going outwards, mm -hmm. then the foundations won't be strong. And they may be okay in the short term, but in the long term, they'll be less resilient and robust against whatever life throws at them. Yeah, and that is, I think, a really powerful message in our society today. Because yes, I, I know so. you're in the UK, but I know here in America, it just seems like there's more and more and more to do and more ways yeah. to do it. Yeah. And that is certainly it's not crazy. the path it feels that many people are taking. No. And I think if we don't teach our children the importance and the ability to mm -hmm. be still and to yes. take breaks and to rest... Mm -hmm. then what, what hope is there that as an adult, they're going to be able to do that? Right, It will right. become instinctive if children learn how to do that. Oh, it'd be so, so much easier to learn as a child. Totally. The other thing I say to parents, because they, they often come back to me when I say, what can you take out of your child's schedule? Mm -hmm. And say to me, but my child isn't tired. They don't appear tired to me. Okay. So I, I give them the analogy of a battery, that a battery works the same whether it's full or whether it has a tiny bit left. Mm -hmm. There is no indication that it's kind of beginning to run on empty and getting down to its last okay. little bit of Done. energy. Yeah. Right. That's a good analogy. And it's the same with children and, and mm -hmm. also often one of the symptoms of depletion and exhaustion in children mm -hmm. is being more and more hyper, uh, more and more unable to stop, less able to sleep well. And I talk about the, the nature of children's chi, mm -hmm. that it rises up. The more tired they get, the more the chi has the tendency to rise up to the head. 
and that's why they they appear to have lots of energy and they're really kind of mm -hmm. you know, talkative and excited and all the rest of it right. but actually that's a sign that they're tired okay. what would you say are some essential skills that practitioners who are interested in treating children need to know or need to work on one of the biggest things is that they need to have a wide range of tools in their treatment toolbox okay so there a lot of children tolerate needles more children mm -hmm. than you would expect tolerate needles however some children don't mm -hmm. and even the ones that do might not tolerate them every time they come to see you or mm -hmm. They might be happy to be needled on their legs, but not on their back, for example. So okay. in the book, I've, uh, I have, have chapters on different techniques that practitioners can use to approach the treatment of children. For example, pediatric tuina, mm -hmm. which is a very effective technique. And children usually really like it they love it yeah um so i have a, a full kind of description of of pediatric to in our shoni shin which is japanese yeah. pediatric acupuncture mm -hmm. i talk about using laser to, okay laser pens to treat children mm -hmm. and i talk about cupping and gua sha and various other techniques so that when the child comes to see you mm -hmm. you as the practitioner don't have to feel any pressure of oh my gosh I'm gonna have to find a way of getting a needle in this child yes you have to have other things to turn to and even though you may end up needling the child mm -hmm. and most often do you're relaxed about it because you know there's no hurry. Maybe you'll spend a couple of sessions just gaining rapport and using other techniques. Mm -hmm. And if you're relaxed, then the child will sense that. Okay. The whole thing will go a lot better. So there's a big focus on the book on approaching the treatment of children with a wide range of treatment methods. Yes. No, I, I read that in the book and I think that is so important and it is good it's to have more tools and children are very sensitive so i think that's very yeah. smart